the scripture and you'll shout it out here in this little bit. Uh, you, you do that. We can glean and gain from each other. Uh, but in John chapter number 13, I'm going to read down through about verse number 11. Uh, and then we'll go back and we'll we'll try to, uh, to look at some different things from the verses there as we go through them. John chapter number 13, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved, he, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured the water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, Therefore, he, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Now like I said, I want to go back and I want to begin to come down through there and we'll try to get as far as we can. But I, one of the first things that I want to focus on is just the simple fact that Jesus knows what's going on. Amen. Yeah. And, 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 and three times, at least three times, and, and the fourth time that it's alluded to in these short verses that, that we have read tonight, we find that Jesus knows something. We find here in verse number one that he knew that his hour was come. We find in number three, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. In verse number seven, we find that he knew what Peter didn't know when he was washing their feet. And then verse number 11, we find that he knew who it was that would betray him. And I think it's important for us to understand as the children of God, he knows what's going on. He knows what's going on. I wonder why it is sometimes we often, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 3 that, uh, that we're to lean not to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. That's what the, uh, Proverbs chapter 3 tells us. Uh, <laughs> What do I is so oft times when we can see over and over in the scripture that he knows what's going on, that he's our last resource. He's the, he's the one we go to when, when we run out of options yeah. for ourselves. I, 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 want you, I want you to get this tonight. I want you to understand and to know that he knows. But as we look here, we find that Jesus knew that, it, that his hour was coming. He knew what was about to happen. And what he is attempting to do and what he is going to set forth to do between now and, the, and, and his arrest in the garden is set his house in order. Because what's about to happen right here is, is these men who have followed him for some three, three and a half years are about to lose their leader in a physical sense. And Jesus wants to give them some last bit instruction. He's going to He's going to instruct them as we go down through here and we'll, we'll be looking at different things in the coming chapters. But he's going to instruct them as we see here tonight. We won't get all of this, but he's going to instruct them on how to deal with one another. How to, how to support and help one another. He's, he's going to deal with them about how to, how to deal with the, the world at large. He's going to, take, he's going to deal with them about, about going out into the world and, and just see what we're talking about 
for this coming Sunday night about reaching to a lost and dying world. He, he's going to teach us about the church. We're going to learn things about the church. And all of these things he's trying and wanting to instill in these men before he leaves and leaves them without his physical presence for a little while. The Bible says that having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. How he is going to do that, he's going to do it by, by way of love. His love for them will never cease. And you, we need to be reassured tonight. You're going to mess up. I'll mess up. We mess up. Sometimes we mess up pretty big. But I want you to know you, your Savior loves you. And, and I want you to know that, that he'll pardon you if you'll, if you'll come to him. I want you to know he can cleanse you and, and, and forgive you. But I love that, 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 that it says, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. His love never wavered. It's funny, I'm thinking right now, John chapter 21, when you go over there, you know, Peter denied the Lord three times. When Jesus over there, John 21, begins to pin Peter down a little bit, and he asked him, he asked him three times, he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He reminded him that he failed and, 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 and put his Putting Peter's faith in this, Peter, he said, if you love me, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And I want you, I, I want you to, to get the sense, and I want you to be reassured tonight of the Savior's love for you. Amen. His love for you didn't stop when you were born again. His love didn't stop sometime in the past. His love for you is relevant, it's current now. Right now. He loved his own unto the end. He never stopped. And what he wants to do, like I said before he leaves, is he wants to share and impart to them some things that are going to help them get through this work. Here's the thing. In verse number two we find this. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. Supper's come to an end. And it's actually, we're going down here in chapter number 13, and a part of supper's come to an end. There's some other things that, that are going to take place. But the main part of supper has ended. And the first thing that happens is the devil. If there's one thing that he wants to do, he wants to mess up what, what the Lord's trying to teach us and trying to show us. Bible says the devil having now put into the heart of Judas was scared. Can I say something right there? The devil can't put nothing in your heart that you don't allow. Right. Right. Uh, we've all heard this in times past. We've all, we've all, we probably have all maybe said it. I don't know. I'm not accused of my name, but we probably, I, know, I don't know why I have. You, you, anybody ever heard or ever said, well, the devil made me do it? Can I tell you that's a lie? Amen. The devil can't make you do nothing. The devil can tempt you. The devil can hang things out in front of you and cause you to desire and lust after them. But he can't make you do anything. We don't believe here. We believe God's a gentleman. God won't make you get saved. Amen. Amen. God won't make you get God gives you the choice. He sent his son to die on the cross of Calvary and Jesus hung between heaven and earth so that you could be saved. But that only matters if you accept what he did. Amen. And in the midst of what Jesus is attempting to, is, is going, and, and he's going to get it across, and we'll see that, but he's going to get it across. The devil sticks his nose in there and says, hey, let me in here. Let me, let, me, let me work on you for just a minute. Let me work on you. The devil, it says, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot. You know why Judas Iscariot did what he did? Because he never trusted the Lord. 
Now, Peter denied the Lord. There's no doubt we have Bible for that. But when Peter did, Peter Bible, the Bible says that Peter repented and wept bitterly, sorrow, sorrowfully. He repented. What Judas did never amounted to what Peter did. Judas got sorry he got caught. Peter, Peter was sorry he betrayed the Lord. There's a difference. And the devil, I, I'm telling you how good that God has been down here in our church and I'm so thankful to be uh, involved with and a part of what God is doing in this place. We have seen and we will see. I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to caution you here. We will see the devil doing more to try to tear it down. And we better learn to be a discerning people. And that's what Peter's a struggling with. We're going to see that in a minute. It, that's what Peter's struggling with is a little bit of spiritual discernment. But rest assured, as, as sure as the Lord is, is trying to help us and grow us and lead us and guide us, the devil is working on somebody. I would go as far as to say this. Maybe not in this sanctuary tonight, but within the membership of this church, within the faithful ones, or within the ones that, that have come and, 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 and be a part of the church, very likely the devil's already working somehow, some way, to create a problem. Hey, Amen. Yeah. We should. Why do you? Because that's what that's what he does. Why would you say that? Because that's what he does. That's what he does. That's his. That's his. That's what he lives for. To tear down what God wants to do. So the devil now, having put in uh, to the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon said, so "I want you to hear something that, that, that that's peculiar." John is John is. John pays attention to detail, and so when he uh, when he mentions who when he mentions you scared he, he he mentions him as Simon's son. You may or may not know this, but there are some other Judases in the Bible. Jesus had a brother named Judas. Uh, you'll find that in Matthew chapter thirteen verse fifty five. Jesus had a brother named Judas. Uh, also, James this. James had a brother named Judas, one of the disciples, which was also a disciple. There's actually two disciples named Judas. And so John is differentiating that, and in, you'll find that in Luke chapter 6 and verse 16, that James, who, whose, brother, whose brother was Judas, was also a disciple. And he also, that this Judas has two other names as well, He's also known as Labius and Thaddeus. And you'll find that in Matthew 10, verse number 3. But you can look over here. If you just turn right over, you'll find uh, in John chapter 14, verse number 22, <clears throat> where there was another disciple whose name was Judas in John 14, 22. The Bible says we know that Jesus is dealing now peculiarly and particularly with the disciples. Judas saith unto him, not a scary. So John is very detail oriented. That's something unique about John's book. He's very detail oriented. He wants you. He he, he adds a lot of things in there uh, that some of the other writers don't. But I thought that was that was pretty neat. How that that John wants you to wants you to know anybody that would have known those disciples. He wanted to know which which one and 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 break it down so everything was clearly understood. But he said it was Simon's son to betray him. Then we go into this again, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he was come from God and went to God. What I see right there in, in, in the fact of his knowledge is, a, is another proof text for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that God had given everything into his hands. He was God. He was God in the flesh and, and his knowledge it, it always irks me, it always bothers me when I, and you probably encountered something like this too, somebody said, well, they thought that, they think that Jesus was a good teacher. He was a good man, uh, maybe like Confucius or Muhammad or something. That's the craziest thing you ever heard in your life. Uh, the Bible's, but Jesus was clear about who he was. The Bible is very descriptive about who he is. You, you, you have, what was I heard downstairs somebody said, I think it was you have to close one eye not to see that. Uh, 
He was God in the flesh. He knew what was happening. He knew his hour was come. He knew that now God was going to, God was going to give him the grace and everything that he needed to finish the course that had been set for him in this life. And something that must have motivated him and encouraged him was this, that he came from God, but he went to God. He knew where he's going. There is nothing, I'll tell you as a pastor, what I mentioned about Brother Bill Ponder and him passing, that family has no worry. No worry. I promise you, you can ask any one of them, they wouldn't have a worry about where Brother Bill is tonight. He's in the arms of the Savior. Nobody would argue that for me. I'm going to tell you something. I've done a few funerals. Brian may have on the back I've done a few funerals where I was fairly certain that was not the case. And I'll tell you, that's tough. And how discouraging that is. But he knew. He knew where he came from. He knew where he was going. And that's a good question we need to make sure we all can answer within ourselves. Not do I follow a creed. Not do I... Not do I even, not even do, do, do I have my name on the membership role of the church? Not any number of things that we can think of, but do I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that when I leave this world, I know where I'm going? I believe you can. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of folk that really don't think you can know. You talk to most most a lot of religious people. I haven't got to say most of them, but they they'll tell you something like this. Well, I hope that. I hope that I've lived good enough. You got two problems right there. You're hoping in the wrong thing and you can't live good enough. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's just a fact. And, and that scares me, bothers me when I hear people, but you hear a lot of that. And that's false doctrine. Amen. That's false teaching. And, 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 and we we need to make sure for, for our part that we've got the right doctrine, we're teaching right, and when somebody comes with something like that, we can help them Amen. to understand that that no, you don't have to hope you can go. You can know you're going. Amen. Amen. I'm glad, listen, I've heard this all my life. Y'all know, I was brought up in church for most of my life, and I've heard all my life. You've heard too. I know that I know that I know. And that sounds cute, and that sounds quicky, if you will, but I know that. That's just a fact for me. I know that. I know. Now, I've been saying this no time, like my dad, I, I, I get a little. Uh, I ain't going to say worry, but you, you you ponder and worry about the cross a little bit. But where I'm going, I am not in debate with myself about it. Jesus knew where he was going. And, and I say this, if you have that assurance, it'll give you a confidence in life that few people have. Amen. It'll give you a confidence in life that, that, that few people enjoy. Yeah. Right. Amen. Mm -hmm. I enjoy knowing that. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. I I'm glad I'm not confused about it. I'm glad I'm not worried about it. I, I'm enjoying the knowledge that I know where I'm going. Amen. And Jesus knew. He knew the suffering. He knew what he was going to go through, but he knew this. He knew it would only last for a while. And praise the Lord, we can do that too. You know what? We could face a whole lot more obstacles in life if we would just understand suffering they endure for a night of joy. Is it night joy cometh in the morning? Suffering endures for a night of joy cometh in the morning. Friend, if you know there's an end to it, and you know that the end is joy in the presence of the Savior, it changes your perspective. He knew where he was going. And praise the Lord that he knew. Now, he knows this. We've done that through. I want you to, I want you to try to put yourself in this crowd of disciples. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. No one's moving. And I imagine this, maybe I imagine too much in the, in the 21st century, but I, I kind of imagine after they've eaten, they're just kind of sitting around the table. They may not be drinking a cup of coffee. I don't know if they Maybe whatever they may be drinking, sitting there. And all of a sudden, Jesus gets up from the table, he takes off his upper garments, and he puts on a towel. Now, I want you to understand it's not the, the work, this towel here. And, and I thought about this. Maybe they're sitting around, maybe there's some light conversation going on, 
Maybe they're talking about what they're going to do tomorrow, how they're going to go out into the city of Jerusalem and, 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 and mingle around or whatever. Then Jesus stands up and will say, like I say, takes off some of his garments, set up the garments, goes on a towel. Now, I do this sometimes, and sometimes it's interesting, but that word that describes towel is lintion. And it made me think of the word linen. But it's a specific, it's a specific kind of garment. It's not just the towel that's laying around. It describes a towel or an apron that servants would put on when they was about to go to work. What's he told them who he was? He's told them he was the Savior. Peter has then confessed that thou art the Christ. We believe that thou art the Christ. They, I mean, there they are. And he, they've seen all these things that he's done. And, and now they're in Jerusalem, fixed to celebrate the Passover. And they've got in their mind, I believe they've got in their mind that he's the Savior. I believe they've got that part of it. But can you imagine a kingly character? Can you imagine, not the president, but a president, or a king, or a queen, whatever. Can you imagine them, that, because this would be an extremely degrading thing to one of them, to lay off the royal clothes, their uh, presidential suit, or whatever. Uh, you can't imagine the president calling him yellow, yellow cab and then when he needs a ride somewhere. Oh, that would be too low and demeaning. But I want you to see here that the king of glory, the God of creation, disrobes himself of, 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 of what would be regular clothing and picks up a towel that a servant would use to go to work. Can you imagine the disciples? Can you imagine what they're thinking? What are you doing? You ever look at somebody that's done something and, and you we are probably ask him, what are you doing? I've said that to myself a lot of times. What are you doing? You ever do that? You ever talk to yourself like this? It's good. You, you stop, you stop laughing sometimes. Just look in the mirror and say, what do you think you're doing? But I, 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 as I was studying through this, I don't imagine them just sitting around and eating and, and really enjoying fellowship. I'm talking about fellowship. And, and, and now supper's ended. Of course, they don't see what has happened to Judas that the Lord knows. Then all of a sudden he gets up from the table where they've been sitting and, and, and he puts on this he puts on this towel that you work in. And the Bible says after that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I want to get you some things out of that with the Lord's help. But I can imagine what they're thinking. As, as, as the Savior has, has taken off some of his clothes, he's put on a, he's put on a, 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 a servant's garment, and he's, he's, he's went over and got a container, and he's poured water in it, and here he gets. Now, we've, we've, we don't do this here. We have done it years. As a matter of fact, it's been years and years ago. I don't remember Brother Brian was here. Uh, and we, we have foot washing done a service many years ago. Uh, and, and I say I'm not opposed to it. As far as that goes, it's not an ordinance as we see it uh, in the New Testament, but for the right reason. But I just it's just hard for me to imagine them disciples sitting there watching Jesus, and all of a sudden he gets up and starts washing their feet. Now, I thought about this. Ephesians 5 and 26, I believe it is. Yeah. He pours water into a basin. Now there's some symbolic, I believe, I mean there's a literal, this is a literal event that's happening, but he's teaching them something, and there's some symbolism that, that, that came to my mind when I read this. In uh, Ephesians 5.26, when, when, when the Bible is, is telling us, Paul's writing about uh, how wives and husbands are supposed to interact with one another, and how Christ loved the church, and uh, it goes down through there and talks about that, those things. In verse 25, it says, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, verse number 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now I thought about that as I was studying that. I thought about that water to me as symbolic of the word. If, if, if we're going to get washed, 
It's going to take the word. Amen. If we're going to get washed, it's going to take the word. Maybe a new, hey, it's going to take God's word. Amen. Not a self-help guru. Not, not some uh, blog writer or YouTuber or whatever. It's going to take God's word to get us clean and then to keep us clean. I, I can't stress to you how much and, and how, how much and how important it is. I, I've had two or three people in here, I think, uh, tell me that they're reading their Bible through, uh, maybe themselves or with their with their wife, family, or whatever. Man, bravo, that's wonderful. Keep doing that. We need that every day. Every day. It keeps us clean. I promise you, you lay the word down just for a little bit and, and, and walk away from it, you're going to get dirty. Right. Amen. Your soul will get dirty. You need it. Just like you need to eat today, you need that word today. Yeah. And I thought about that water as the word. Then I thought about that basin. That basin's a container. And it contained every bit of water that he poured into it. Then I thought about this old Bible. It's got words in it. But between these two covers right here is every word that I need. Amen. 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 It, it, and, and listen, not just the parts that we like is, is good to keep us clean, Amen. but the parts we don't like too. Amen. Amen. The parts that tell us things we don't like to hear. We've talked about we've talked about this a couple times here like <laughs> the doctrine of hell. I don't like that, but it's in there. We're gonna hang on to it. Amen. Because he taught it, he gave it to us two teeth, and so on. And it all, all of it keeps us clean. And I, I, I will stress that to you. Stay in the book. Yeah. Stay in the book. Have a have a daily Bible reading plan. Have a and it's good, I tell you something, it's really good. Have a set time to read your Bible. Have a set time. Set you a routine. That's a good thing to do. Set your routine and have you a daily Bible reading plan. And you ought to be, I, I think you ought to try to read through it here. It's good. If you ain't, if you ain't done, started that yet, it ain't too late to start. You can catch up. You'll have to read a little extra on a couple days. But you can do it. But it's good. For, I did it last year. For, in all honesty, first time I'd ever done it, I did last year. I actually had it done in half a year. You can do that. But I'm telling you, the word and what he's, what he's showing them is, you're going to get dirty. You're going to have to be clean. And I'm going to show you how to stay clean. Friend, his precious word is, is what we need to keep us clean. After that, he pours water into the basin again to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was dirty. He took that instrument, that servant's instrument, that towel, and began to just rub it in. I thought, now, now my mind, is a little funny sometimes, works a little bit, a little bit, but I thought about how the Holy Ghost does that. How he just takes and applies that word to your life. You know how you, uh, how you get the Bible to apply to your life on a daily basis, how you get something from it that'll help you that day is when the Holy Ghost applies that to you. When you, one of the best things to do in Bible reading is before you even start reading is to pray. Pray and ask God to open it up to you. I love doing that. Because it's amazing when the Lord show you things when you start praying and say, Lord, help me to see something. I pray this. I said, Lord, show me something fresh today. I was talking to my uncle on the phone this afternoon at the homeroom. We was talking about Bible. He was fixing to go in and study. And I had been studying. And, and we was talking about how this book, 2,000 years old, nearly 2,000 years old, and still today, there's about 35, 40 folk in here, 30, 35 folk in here, Every one of us in here can open this book up today and get something fresh, relevant to us personally, and good. Every day. You can do it tomorrow or the day after that. I love the Word. I love the Bible. I, I mean, I just love what it does for me, how it helps me and encourages me. I love how it chastens me. Hey, A lot of people don't like this part, but I do. I love that because I know that that's God dealing with me. Just like when I was young, I didn't understand when I'd get away. I didn't understand that then. I didn't like it. When I grew older, I understood my parents was trying as best they knew how 
to correct me in some things. I like it when it corrects me. The Bible says it's good for reproving correction. Amen. But we take it, we don't like that part. We, and I tell you, the world in general hates that part. They don't, they'll take that exhortation. Amen. They'll take that encouragement, but they don't want any of that, any of that rebuke or that reproof or that correction. We leave all that part out. But it's all necessary. It's all necessary. And uh, he begins to he begins to wipe. Wipe their, wipe their feet and wash their feet. I like this. John says, then, come and feed Simon Peter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Simon Peter was, was one of the mo more outspoken disciples. You hear uh, him saying no more than most of the other disciples. He's more of the outspoken ones. You've got to be careful when you're outspoken. Because sometimes you can speak out Badly. Amen. The Bible says, Then he cometh to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Uh, Peter, Peter says what maybe the rest of them are thinking, but Peter didn't have no restraint, or Peter didn't have no uh, filter, I guess what they say now. And uh, Peter said, what are you doing? He's watched. It's funny. He's watched the Lord. I don't know how many he's been done before. I don't know how many he's watched before he got Peter, but it's obvious to me by reading the scripture. He's, he's done one or two or whatever. <laughs> then came through Peter, and Peter said, Wilt thou wash my feet? Dost thou wash my feet? Now I thought about this. Peter's not. Peter's not understanding the spiritual application right now. And that's okay. Can I say there's things that goes on in your life that the Lord does that at the time they're happening, you don't understand what he's doing. Amen? There's times that things are they're going on in your life and you're looking at everything and you're looking at you say, Lord, I don't understand why this is happening. And I think that's the sense that we get from what Peter is saying. He's, he's not understanding the spiritual, uh, the spiritual application. Sometimes it's just best to hush. I, I think sometimes we, we tend to object before God's done trying to show us something. And we get in trouble. I, I wrote this now. Uh, Peter here is completely unable to stand, understand the spiritual application and because of this he is going to object. He don't understand it so he's going to throw in his objection. I don't always understand what the Lord's doing. I show up sometimes on Sunday morning and I've got a message on my heart. I, I think, well, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, and, and it's funny. Here's an experience that, that, is, that is common to me. So all times, the, the, the times when I think and I've studied and I've, I've got my notes and I've got this and I've got all these thoughts and and, and I this this past Sunday morning I, I'll just be honest with you, this past Sunday morning I felt so inadequate and so unprepared to stand and preach and the Lord the Lord showed up and before I even got to preach the Lord just started moving and I love that. I love that. I, I've learned, I've learned over, over time to wait on the Lord. And it's tough. It's tough. But it's one of the greatest things. And one of the things that I believe he's trying to teach here is, is, is just patience. Because it's not always easy to wait on the Lord. He, can, he said, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Peter's, Peter's, Peter's not, he's not giving. But I, I wrote this down to, to save humiliation and embarrassment. It's best sometimes just keep our mouth shut. Because Peter's, Peter's essentially rebuking the Lord. And Jesus said, verse number seven, Jesus said, answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt not, but thou shalt know hereafter. I, I believe it's plain and simple, but I believe it was a stern response to Peter's this. Peter, you don't understand. So write it down. You don't understand, but give it time. 
and we read. I love how the Lord works. Because here's what I've learned. He don't work on my time. <laughs> he don't work the way I tell him to. <laughs> he don't even work the way I like him to. And sometimes he don't work the way I want him to. But what I have seen is the way that he does work is the best way. And that's that, that's a thing that comes with experience and, and time. And some of us older saints in here have been saved while we've learned some things. We've learned some things. You understand that that Peter's only been with the Lord three, three and a half years, and he's still got some learning to do. But the Lord says to him, he said, you don't understand what, what I'm doing, but in time you will. And I, I think that we could learn a lot about patience and how much less complicated our lives would be if we just let the Lord do his things on his on in his way. Save us a lot of save us a lot of headache. But I like this. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never well, I say it like this. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt I like verse nine there. Peter saith unto him, verse number eight, thou shalt never wash my feet. I wrote down there, I thought this is a funny thought. There is Jesus at the feet of Peter. He's the God who one day stepped out of on nothing and said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, let there be all, you know, all six days of Christ. He's the same one that with the Father and the Holy Spirit reached down and formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed breath into him, and he became a living soul, performed the first surgery, do you know Adam spoke every language in the world? How many of us do that? Married the prettiest woman in the world. I mean, he had it going on. And the Lord did every bit of that. And there is Peter, the rock, you know, telling the Savior, the God of creation, you're not washing my feet. You know what I've done now? Chances are good you've done that. Lord's trying to do something in your life, and you say, No, 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 no. It's scary to think that we'd have that, that much bravado or moxie or whatever you want to call it about us that we would actually tell God, No. The people do it on a daily basis. But you get picture in your mind. There's the Savior. He's fixed this water basin, a, a, a basin of water. He's got the towel. He's going around washing the disciples' feet. He's spoken, and he's come to Peter, and Peter began to object. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now, I want to tell you, that is a very strong statement, and it's important for you and me that we understand what the Lord said. Uh, we could read on, we, we will read that, that he that is, in verse number 10, he that washed is not saved to wash. Uh, he that is washed needeth not saved to wash his feet, but is clean. In, in, in traveling through the world, and he's going to explain that to them, that you're going to get some dirt on you. I had never heard this before. I was talking to my, my uncle this afternoon. I, I've never heard this before, but it's very applicable. He said when he was little, <clears throat> running around, he said his his mama would say to him sometimes he got rusty ankles. Anybody ever heard that? You got rusty ankles. Yeah. Got rusty ankles. You got dirt on you. You got hot sweating. You got dirt. I've had them, but you got hot sweating. You got dirt on around your ankles, and she tell you you got rusty ankles. The best you can do, you're gonna get some dirt on. And and the thing about it is is trying to be a servant of the Lord, and and Peter being a disciple, he is a he is, a, he, is a, he is an apostle. So he has apostolic powers. He's going to be looked on. He's going to be watched. He's going to be observed. He's going to be followed. And the, the, only, the, the only way that we can do that and be of any benefit of the Lord is to make sure we stay clean. We, we, have, to, we have to separate. We talk about separation here. We have to separate ourselves from the things of the world. Yeah. 
Amen. We can't we can't tie ourselves or hitch ourselves to what the world is doing. We have got to because if we're doing that, if we're if we're if we're if people can't look at us and tell it now we're not perfect, understand. But when people look at us and see us doing the same things that the world is doing, I've heard this before, chances are you have too. Why do I need to be a Christian? I'm living better than you are anyway. I mean, can you imagine? That down here was it was the green turtle, what do we call that place down here? Green platform. Is it green turtle, green lantern, thirsty dogs in there? Can you imagine drop, leaving here and I get out real quick and I get gone? You pull out and go down and go that way and turn down the port there and see my truck sitting over there and go where that be sitting there on one of them tables. Listen. It is imperative and important for us that we stay clean. Amen. Amen. It's imperative and important that we stay separated. He's trying to teach them something. Because these men, down in the book of Acts, I can't remember what chapter it is, but, but the book of Acts talks about these men, these disciples, and it says these men have turned the world upside down. That's these men are who God's going to use. And for God to use somebody, they're going to have to be clean. Right. If you're not clean, the only thing God can use you for is a bad example. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's what happens when we get fouled up and, 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 and are not clean. The only thing God can use us for is a bad example. And I promise you the devil will. But he, but, he, but he said, thou hast no part with me. That word part right there has to do with a ministry. It's not talking about his salvation. If you look that up, it's not talking about his salvation. It talks about the part that, that Jesus has for Peter to do. Jesus has got a mission. He, Jesus has got a, a work that Peter has to do. And we go through uh, Acts and we'll start, we'll see now all the things that Peter did. He was a wonderful, powerful preacher. First one on the day of Pentecost to stand up and start preaching and explain what was going on. I mean, God used him in a mighty way, but he told him here, said, Peter, if I don't do this, your ministry is going to be destroyed. And that hit me. That hit me like ten bricks because I've got a ministry. And if I don't keep myself clean, it will destroy my ministry. It will destroy my character, my witness, my testimony. There's a lot of Christian folk tonight. And, and I may, some of them have been saying that if that's said on God, and they have destroyed their ministry and their witness and their character and have tried to come back and can never be as effective as they once was. Can never, and can never be as effective as they once was. And I don't want that. I, I'm far from perfect, but I want to be biblical. I want to be clean. I want to be whole. We got to be careful. We don't bring a reproach on the church. On the things that's right. Amen. We got to be very careful about that. I don't want to be a reproach to the things of God. And 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 I believe Peter understood it. I believe Peter understood. I believe what Jesus said went to his soul. Because the next verse says this: Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. When he got it, I, I wrote down on the light come on. <laughs> the light come on. And Peter said, oh, I'm starting to see some things now. And, and when he did, he wasn't sure that what Jesus was doing was enough. I mean, he now I, I, I think Peter's fully accepted like this is what this has got to happen. I want that part. He said, not my hands and my feet, but my head uh, or not my feet only. But also my hands and my my head. You know what I believe he wanted? I believe he wanted to serve. Him. And and he understood from what Jesus said, if, if I don't allow this, if I don't allow God to do this in my life right now, my ministry, my part, my what what he has for me is going to be destroyed. Be careful. Be careful. How we conduct ourselves, how we live our life. Be honest. I think we've done our uh, church together that were honest our uh, exemplary in our deportment our, about halfway down that exemplary. This means conducting yourself in a Christ-like way. 
took that a little bit. That's so much that hard for me. But act like Jesus. Stay clean. And he got it. He got it. Some people say, he won't help my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And then Jesus saith unto him. And there's, this, there's a lot of doctrine here, and I will give all that. I'm going to hush it again. But he said, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every work, every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now, we know here that uh, we know here that Jesus in the end of this verse is speaking about Judas. But he, but he's saying, he's saying, he's saying to Peter, if you've trusted me, you're saved. If you've trusted me, you're complete and you're whole. If you've trusted me, you're clean. But you're going to come in contact with some dirt from time to time. Walking through this world, you can't help it. You may ever, try, you may ever go to the beach and try to get back to your car without getting sanded. <laughs> It was funny about, about three weeks ago when little Ben was up here. It'd been over, it'd been like six weeks ago that we were down there and I took Ben to the beach one day and I, 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 I was a little chilly with that jacket on. I caught Ben putting sand in his pockets. <laughs> he was licking the seashells and sticking sand in his pockets. That's weird. I don't know how to do it. But anyhow, just a, just a couple of weeks ago when he was up here, I took him visited with me. And uh, we went down and, and sat with Poppy for a minute. And I'm sitting there in the chair at Poppy's, and Ben, I noticed Ben, I didn't register with him at the time, but I noticed him, he's sticking his hand in his pocket, and he's pulling something out, and he's laying it on my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked, and I thought, where'd he get that salt? That ain't salt, that's uh, sand. <laughs> his jacket wasn't clean. He had it. I'm saying, what, did you try to, you, once you get that stuff on, you can't get it out. You got to take three baths and scrub with the SOS pad and get that out. Once we get dirt, the filth of this world will call us. Outside of the cleansing of the word, we'll never get it out. We've got to have it. That's why we preach about the word. That's why we love the word. That's why we hold it up and honor it. Because it keeps us where we need to be. And he said, that's all, that's all you need. Peter, you need to keep your feet clean. You need to, church, keep your feet clean. Amen. Keep your feet clean. That's all I'm going to try to give you tonight. Anybody else got anything on the scripture to pass it out? I'm going to get out and ask the Lord to lay on my heart. And I hope, hope I think you were blessed in your same way, maybe mad or something. Amen. Anybody? Well, Joe, you mentioned Judas here several times tonight. Mm -hmm. As you get out in there. <coughs> 